Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to I Made It Through the Hellscape. That is Job Search Part Two, a panel discussion uh, for early career devs by early career devs. My name is Chris, and I am also an early career uh, junior developer myself, and I'm super excited to be moderating this event and being able to chat with Vanessa, Louie, Sammy, who are going to be your amazing panelists for tonight. So if you've been following us for some time, uh, we actually had a very successful first run of this panel discussion back in May of this year. So um, we we're really excited about it, and we really wanted to bring it back. Um, and tonight we're again hosted by Tech Tank, which is the organization that I'm part of. And we're an active group of devs, designers, PMs, and other techies that range from mostly junior and early career professionals, all the way to seniors with over 10 years of experience. And we host job related workshops and sessions like these, as well as study groups and in person social events in Toronto. So if you're interested in joining, we do have a Slack group. Um, and we'll plug in the link now and also at the end. And it also looks like Nonso has linked the um, a Google Docs where you can share your LinkedIn. So please go ahead and do that. Um, and at the very end of our panel discussion, you'll have a chance to ask questions to the panelists, either through the, through the chat or you can raise your hand and unmute mute your mic. And after that, we can also make a little bit of time if we have um, any time left to do some casual networking and uh, share our LinkedIn's. Um, so we're again super happy that you're here, um, and especially in this ongoing bleak job market that seems to be, uh, you know, never ending. And we feel it's really important to um, reflect and kind of share what we've learned along the way. Um, and hopefully you can pick up a few tricks or two from our discussion tonight. So without further ado, we are going to meet your panelists one by one. Um, let me add spotlight. Where are you, Louis? Right here. Okay, these are your panelists for tonight. Uh, one joining us from the sea, one joining us from the forest, one joining us from his dark room somewhere. So welcome, welcome. Um, let's start with uh, some brief intros. Um, let's go around maybe this way because I see Vanessa to my right and then Louis and then Sammy. So let's go that way. Um, so maybe uh, tell us a little bit about your work, where, you know, where do you work, what your, what's your job title, when did you start, and maybe a little bit about your tech stack. Hi, I'm Vanessa, and I work as a front-end engineer at SciShield, which is located in Boston, but I am working remotely in California, uh, particularly the San Francisco Bay Area. And my tech stack is Vue as like the main front end development work. And um, my previous experience or career before switching over was um, clinical lab science, which is um, being a scientist behind the scenes in laboratories at hospitals and biotech companies. Hi. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Louie, and I work um, at a company called Integrated Eco Strategy that's located in the hills of western Massachusetts, where I live. Um, I started working there full time in May as a front end focused full stack developer, mostly using TypeScript, React, GraphQL, and occasionally touching the back end, which is Ruby on Rails. Um, I'm also a career transitioner. I worked in a a few different fields uh farming wilderness therapy guiding um land management and i was doing municipal water treatment when i decided to learn coding uh, via a boot camp in 2022. my name is sammy i work at elevate security as a full stack developer my primary tech stack is React in the front end and then Python in the back end with Postgres as their database. And I'm also a career transitioner from the blue collar side where I was an electrician in my past. I did IT technician work and I also ran a car wrapping business. Wow, so diverse. Um, let's get a little bit into kind of, um, I know everybody here is a career transitioner, but 
Um, and you told us a little bit about what you used to do or, or the breadth of things that's, that you used to do, but maybe tell us a little bit more about your learning journey. Learning journey. Um, I know some of you mentioned you did a boot camp and some of you definitely were self-taught, but maybe tell us a little bit about that journey, how long it took, how long it took for you to like start looking for a job, et cetera. We'll go in the guess, same order. Yeah, okay. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I did the self-taught route um, and I started doing full-time learning, leaving my previous career back in 2022, which is last year, starting in April, and then started looking for jobs in August, September. So I guess you would say it took about maybe 10 months to look for work and I got my first job offer back in May. So I just started working um, in June. Um, and then my uh, time frame isn't too different from Vanessa's. Um, early 2022, I started doing a little self-learning of like CSS and HTML. And then in March, I started a 40-week part-time boot camp while I was working my previous job. Um, and then started started applying places very underprepared in August and September, and then received my offer in late April and started in May. So yeah, about nine, nine or so months. I started learning around February of 2022, left my job July 1st of 2022, self-taught pretty much. And then I did a boot camp to learn how to speak professionally rather than actually learning. And my job hunt started in January, letting my first offer in February, and then one in March, one in May. And my final one that I accepted was June. Nice, awesome. We're gonna come back to reject uh, the, the uh, all the offers that you rejected, Sammy, later on. But um, let's uh, maybe switch gears to talking a little bit about, um, you know, telling us, tell us the story of how you actually navigated the job search. So um, I think you all taught us how, uh, you all told us um, how long your job search period um, was, but maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what was the most difficult part of your job search? Um, and how did you overcome it? So, you know, for example, I think a lot of common things that people face are like imposter syndrome, or if you had any, you know, nightmarish interviews um, or uh, situations that you ran into and things like that. For me, um, my job strategy changed all the time. When I started applying last year in August, September, I just went with the spray and pray method, which is to apply to as many open positions I can find through LinkedIn, through another website um, called Indeed, and maybe otta.com, O-T-T-A.com. So anything I can find. Um, and I got two callbacks from that first period of applying with my first version of resume and one was just telling me that I don't have enough experience within like 10 minutes of that conversation and the other was just I was I was just a little bit late there was already someone one step ahead who finished the project ahead of time so it was like a quick process and I just got left behind and afterwards there was like a dry period of nothingness because it was approaching the holidays. So from November, December, January, February, and that there was like a four month period of no feedback or nothing from anything um, from any of my applications. But during that time, that was when I changed my strategy, which is to fulfill the requirement of just having enough experience. And I did that by starting to volunteer at a coding brigade um, by supporting their civic projects and then found an, an internship, even though it was unpaid, but it was like a really 
valuable experience for me. And I was able to put those two positions on my resume. And that was when I started seeing changes in callbacks or feedback from my second type of resume. Um, I also did a hackathon. So I just added as much as as many things as possible in my resume to help me stand out from like the competition. And it was springtime and I heard like that was when, you know, hiring will start pick up again. And so from that second type of resume, I heard back one from LinkedIn through their apprenticeship um, application program. And another, another is through Charles Schwab, who actually picked up my my old resume from uh, December. So, but that was when I learned how to, um, practice um, interview. Sorry, something just started playing. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> okay. My Spotify started playing, putting background music in my headphones. So I was getting distracted. <laughs> so I paused that. Either way, um, so from that experience, I learned how to do like job interview, the technical side of the interview process. Um, like, so that was when I started applying like my leak code skills but nothing came out of that. And then I, but during that whole time, I just kept applying until I found my my current job um, where I was able to impress them through my previous experience as a scientist because that company um, provides solutions for scientists everywhere. So that's basically my job hunting journey. Um, I apologize if I repeat some of the same things Vanessa just said, because again, I feel like we had a very similar experience at certain points in the last nine months. But um, yeah, when I started in August and September, um, it was similar, just like mass applying to whatever listing I could find. Um, if memory serves, there did seem to be more like entry level roles that were being posted, but I don't know how many of them were actually like real. Um, I got two I did have like two initial interviews from that process as well and similar just kind of being told like oh we didn't think you had enough experience but but we wanted to talk to you about this like internship we might be doing in like nine months and fast forward nine months neither of those companies did those internships over the summer um but yeah then over the winter I heard, found out about and participated in the Collab Lab program, um, which is a volunteer run, sort of like eight week mentoring apprenticeship developer program, um, which is really cool and invite people to check out if you can. Um, so I was able to add some experience onto my resume that way. And then I was uh, fortunate that a friend of mine who I had done an informal unpaid internship with for a few months in the fall at the startup he worked for um, when I finished my boot camp in December they needed some help with some extra work so I started doing part-time contract work with them in January um, but unlike Vanessa even when I had a little bit more experience on my resume I still get pretty much like January through March still wasn't hearing back from anybody <laughs> um, but the my current job or the job that I ended up getting, they contacted me, I guess that was in February, um, about an interview um, and that went well with like a take home assignment. And then when they were getting ready to make the offer, they were having some financial indecision. So it turned into a uh, contract with the possibility of hire um, in February. So I ended up having another like, semi-contract position on my resume and for the next two and a half three months I was still applying and had gotten a little better at like networking and like following up and kind of like meeting people um but still didn't didn't have anything come to fruition besides just a lot of initial recruiter calls um which I always thought went well but again it was probably the 
an experience side, an experience resume that they were like pushing through and hiring managers were like, well, we have a thousand of these. So um, yeah, and the, I guess my biggest struggles were definitely finding opportunities for the interviews because in, in the end I had a total of like four over the course of nine months um, out of I didn't keep track but a lot of applications <laughs> over that time. so like your guys like you guys did as well I also sprayed and prayed in the very beginning then I had a coffee chat with Chris and she's like oh you should network a lot more and I wasn't very comfortable at the time but look at me now but I ended up networking a lot more through the spray and pray method though. I still spread and prayed throughout and I spread and prayed in terms of networking, but just cold applying. I did manage to get one offer where the guy only interviewed me because I had League of Legends and I still play League of Legends with him to this day. And then another offer was because of a network, his, his network had a, had a job position open for me. So he referred me to that. I got that. And then the position had a lot of politics attached to it. And the glass door were very, very bad considering the size of the top company and how many employees it had. So I refused that. And I ended up after that one, I got a job in WordPress where they really liked me. They liked my work and they didn't really do tech tests. It was a lot of behavioral rather than technical skills. So I didn't have to use any lead code or anything. But I knew I wouldn't be happy in Word doing WordPress. So I respectfully declined that one. And the current company that I'm working at, I had a coffee chat with the director where he actually made this position for me. So I wasn't competing against anyone. It was just for me, as long as I completed the tech test, which was a full stack app, which I don't recommend anyone doing because <laughs> it takes a, a lot of time. And he ended up, giving me the position and I'm working there now. But I would say a lot of things that did help was being an organizer for Toronto JS, helping out at React Native, also helping out at Tech Tank, help build my network and my notoriety locally. So a lot of people knew my face and connected with me just based off of that. Yeah, I mean, that's really awesome. But I'm, I'm curious to know, um, I think for each of you, I think um, if we put like a timeline to it, at least like a minimum of nine months ish for you to kind of get to where you need it to be. And, you know, I think several years ago, maybe as long as you knew, um, I guess, you know, you could probably get a job as a developer if you know how to open VS Code, I don't know, but like <laughs> things have changed, right? Like I think now, you know, I think they say to get your first offer, to get your first job, I think, it'll take at least like a minimum of six months. And that is a minimum. Um, and for a lot of people, you know, like Louis was saying, even if you do have that experience, you still weren't getting it. So let's talk a little bit about how to deal with that stress. You know, how did you deal with those disappointments of, um, you know, you feel like you're, you're putting yourself out there. You feel like you're doing it all and you don't, you know, what did you do to make sure you don't give up? Or what did you do to kind of help yourself, pick yourself back up to, you know, continue to knock on those doors, to continue to um, build those connections and things like that? For me, um, I think I had two specific strategies when I think about it. One is to have a community. Um, so LinkedIn is a great place to find other people like you or like me uh, struggling with trying to find jobs or being in the same position as a junior dev trying to find the first job. So I would often connect with individuals and do one-on-ones and just, you know, vent about like what we're doing, what went well, what didn't go wrong, what did, what went wrong. And I remember like I had a chat with Eric, he's in the audience, but I, um, yeah, it's just experiences like that. You connect with someone through LinkedIn and just share how you feel. And that helps you feel motivated to keep going and to feel like you're not alone. So I think number one, um, having a community or having that network of people that you can talk to helps you to keep going. 
And the second strategy that helped me was having a part-time job at my last um, career. So while I was job hunting and learning and trying to expose myself uh, in, in the tech industry, I also work part-time. And every time I go to work, it's like a reminder, like I, I'm done with this work and I'm ready to move on. So every time I go in, I'm like, okay, I need to keep, I need to keep going and don't give up or else this is my life again for another 10 years or so. So at that point, I was just very motivated to move on. So having that old job I had was the, like, was the fire that keep me going. Yeah, I think uh, similarly for me, it was a mix of like internal and external motivation. Um, part of probably what I got the most out of my boot camp was sort of the like commiserating with a group of what ended started out as like almost forty and ended up as like twelve by the end of the boot camp. Um, just kind of sort of commiserating while we were all going through the same thing and then after boot camp meeting more people through linkedin and hearing their stories it's definitely like helpful to know that you're not alone um actually i had a good talk with eric of shameless plug self-taught devs as well around that shortly i think before vanessa <laughs> um and even before i got on the show we had a chat and he was like it, it was after i had like landed the first contract and he was like He's like, dude, you're doing it. And I was like, I haven't like told myself that. So thank you. <laughs> um, and yeah, so a lot of that out, outside support was huge. Um, and then like intrinsically, I've a lot of those jobs I worked were very low paying and uh, pretty labor intensive. So over the years of working um, low paying labor jobs sort of like um it kind of helped me like go into this with like like I guess it wasn't like a chip on my shoulder but sort of just like uh, a resolve that like I knew going into this that it was going to be like the hardest thing that I had ever done like professionally speaking um so I kind of anticipated that it was going to suck for parts of it <laughs> um so it kind of helped me stay like detached from a lot of the like job process and um it, job hunting like right before the mass layoff started it was like well I can either give up now after a year <laughs> and all this like money invested and stuff money and time invested or I can keep going and also just having a, a young family and just wanting to make the world better for a little four-year-old or he was like two when I started four now <laughs> um also it was like a big a big kick in the, the pants some days so a lot of my motivation was also external and internal I had friends who kept it realistic with me saying it was very hard and it's not impossible to do but it's going to be extremely hard considering my situation of not having a degree and whatnot so he kept it very real so I had that kind of chip on my shoulder and like, hey, I can do this. <clears throat> and also had friends who recently just graduated computer science. And I also wanted to prove to them I'm like, hey, I can learn this on the Internet. I could probably get a job before you. So it's you don't like that feeling when you're competitive with somebody, but they don't know you're being competitive with them. And you're like in your own head. So I kind of had that feeling with him. And that helped motivate me a lot. What also did help was treating it like a job. So nine to five, I would have my actionable goals, like 100 LinkedIn connections, at least 10 coffee chats a week. And after five o'clock, I would shut down my computer, go go to the gym, do whatever, make sure I keep track of my mental health and whatnot, and my physical health. And a, another motivation was, I was an electrician and a car wrap owner, but it, I did it concurrently. So I was doing anywhere from 16 hour minimum days to 22 hours, where I would just sleep for two hours and then just go back to work as an electrician and I did not want to do that again in my life considering how much time it took out of my personal life like the money was great but I definitely want the time back so I took that as internal motivation to never want to 
go back to a blue collar job. But major respect to anyone who's in a blue collar job. Yeah, wow. Um, I love that, you know, uh, all of you are coming from different backgrounds, yet I think the motivation to to succeed is actually quite similar. Um, and I, I think a lot of us could probably share that because, you know, everybody here is probably either self-taught or, you know, they went through it the unc unconventional way and it's not, it, it's not easy at all. You know, it is probably one of the most difficult things that we've did, we've ever done, but, um, you know, hopefully, you know, we can tell you, like, you know, they can tell you that it's totally worth it. Um, now let's t go on to kind of, um, I know, I think we, we've been talking a little bit about, you know, some of the job search tactics or things that you have done in your job search. But if you had to choose one or two top, like the, the two best things that you did to help yourself um, get your job or, or, or some of the most important things that you think a job, job seeker right now should know, um, for this current job market. Um, if you can share those with us, that'll be great. I need a minute to think about it. So okay. Louis or Let's... Sammy. I can go. Um, my, I think my first one I would recommend doing is um, don't introduce yourself and ask for a referral immediately to somebody you've met um i was surprised by the amount of those that i received um within like a week of starting my job and and didn't have like don't have a very big linkedin presence and also if you went to the company page um of my work you would see that there are like 14 employees so <laughs> um the odds of hiring two junior developers and 2023 to a dev team of four are pretty slim um and also i just have seen that in advice lots of places um and the like there's a lot of different advice out there um i always i after my first round of like spray and pit spray and pray applying i got very like disheartened like i could like feel myself physically getting sad when i would read through like the linkedin job board <laughs> just because i it was just never encouraging so i always tried to like spend as much time as i could finding like other job boards or going directly to company pages um and usually i was targeting like small to medium-sized companies in general just because i for some of the bigger big tech and other bigger companies, I knew there'd be way more people applying. Um, I guess those are the first two that come to mind. I can go next if you're not ready, Vanessa. So mine would also be coffee chats and treating it similar to how I'd make a new friend. So like I would swear, I'd talk about my hobbies, talk about how I'm feeling, talk about what I'm eating, not necessarily treating them like oh, hey, this is transactional. Please give me a job just because I talked to you on a video chat. And then my second best job strategy is like getting yourself out there, whether it's in the community, online or in person. I think that really helped me because it might not directly help you get a job, but it will definitely teach you a lot of technical issues that you wouldn't have never looked at. Like a lot of people have taught me about caching or OAuth and walk me through processes, just having like the 10, 15 minute conversations, just like seeing them in person and whatnot. And I felt like me being able to talk to that to a certain extent really did help me stand out as a junior to interviewers. Thanks everyone for giving me time. Um, I thought of something and that is have some kind of data on your job hunting. Like, I think I use my resume as a way to find out if it's doing well or not. In the beginning, I just used templates and then kept changing it until I feel like I'm getting enough callbacks or feedback. And I actually invested in getting my resume professionally edited and looked at and so I was able to collaborate with 
the editor who used to be a recruiter for tech companies. So she had the eye to tell me like what they might be specifically looking for. Um, and that you're, you're not using your resume to beat the ATS because actually a person's actually looking at it. Um, unless it's like a knockout question, like if they ask you how many years of experience you have then but you see like there's a requirement of like three or something in the job description that's when I go okay I don't I won't even try to apply if if they ask this question because that's like an automatic knockout question so I just move on to another application so um, that was that's one thing I thought of another is to be ready for any technical interview I I get ready with Lee code. I actually don't mind Lee code. I, I love it. And I do one-on-ones or I, or I schedule um, virtual meetings with people in the LinkedIn community and do some Lee coding together or practice like technical interviewing. So when I actually get a real interview, I'd be, be, be better prepared for that one and try to like do my best during that interview process. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. Actually, just a follow up question to Vanessa, just because you don't often hear people say I love lead code. I think that is something nobody says, really. But um, just if I want to follow up on that, and I, I've seen you post like live videos of you doing lead code. And I, I remember what I remember I watched one of them back when you posted on LinkedIn. And I was like, wow, I would never do something like this. But this is amazing. Um, the, like, I guess what um, you know, even if I'm not sure, like if you've actually done lead code type questions on a technical interview, but even if not, how do you think that whole practice kind of helped you with being uh, better prepared technically, whether for an interview or even in your job? Yeah, practicing lead coding or technical interviewing with someone just helps shave off that nervousness of trying to speak technical with somebody and when I do these practices, it helps me um, slow down my brain and explain concepts to the other person so they understand what I'm talking about. And and actually, I've done technical interviews where I had to code live. And my takeaways from those is that you can, you know, uh, talk about what you want to code and then do do write little notes or comments on what you want to do or what the function is supposed to do um and then code it up and then talk about it so it's kind of hard to code and talk at the same time like of course we're not like youtubers you know running a tutorial but this is an interview process that means you want to convey as much clearness in your thought process and it's okay for you to write comments and code separately or even say things um, separately. So I think that's what tripped me up before with technical interviews. Um, but that's that would be my advice for anyone who want to tackle technical interviews is to just, you know, try to keep them separate as long as you make yourself clear with the interviewer. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about, and I think I, Louis mentioned um, something about this. So if you um, I want to think of something else, but, or um, the question is, what do you think are some of the biggest mistakes that you see current job seekers making? We can switch around the order if Vanessa wants to think on it. Yeah, I, I, go first. I have something. Oh, oh you, go, go ahead. ahead. If you want. Um, so the two biggest mistakes I see are people aren't doing enough coffee chats. And when they do do coffee chats, there's something quite robotic there. It seems very transactional to the person on the opposite side. And I've had coffee chats like that, where it's very transactional. Hey, can you refer me to your company? But if I would refer you to my company, it's more like, Hey, are we a good fit culturally? Like, can I stand being around you for eight hours? Or can I ask you questions and whatnot. How do you do in that type of situation? And my second mistake that a lot of people are using or making is 
they're not treating the job application process as a job because it is a job, right? Whether you're applying, whether you're networking, I see a lot of the people I mentor, they're waking up at like 11, 12, 1, doing whatever and just applying whenever they feel like applying. But if you have a strict motivation and discipline where you're applying between nine to five, it definitely makes it a lot easier. And I see it across my mentees where they're finding it a lot more, a lot less mentally draining if they treat it like a job. For me, um, I want to say, like, don't appear desperate. Um, people on the other side can feel it, can sniff it out. Um, and desperation looks like something where you're like, please help me, please get me a job, please refer me. Like, people will not, you know, refer you or help you out if you're desperate because you're putting so much pressure on that person. And that person might not even have the resources or the job opening or the referral to be able to help that person. So I think a lot of that desperation comes from like, you know, a genuine place that someone wants to find a job because, you know, they don't have any more savings left or um, they don't have any money coming in soon. But I think that's something where you have to take responsibility where you can take yourself out of that desperation and it could mean like picking up a part-time job so you don't feel so desperate um, in job interviews or even networking so I think when I think back to my experience having a part-time job and you know job hunting at the same time it puts me in a better like secure spot. So there's no sense of desperation for me. And of course, I try not to have expectations that I will get a job. And that's what I had to learn a lot um, in the beginning, not feeling rejected or so, so sad after rejection. I mean, it's okay to feel that first rejection, but then learn that you will get more rejections after that. And you just need that one yes, or three yeses, like, Sammy but either way <laughs> try not to appear desperate and if you feel that desperation uh, fix it as soon as you can yeah and yeah I mentioned the immediately asking for referral thing already but um, yeah I think for me um even when I was trying to like actively network with roles that I had like just applied to, um, I was still sort of envisioning the networking as like a long-term goal. I, I didn't have any expectations that like I would apply for a role and then look at their hiring team and then see that no one was active on LinkedIn or anything. And then magically hear back and get like an interview a week later. Um, I found like the more that I did that, there was maybe like, a 10 or 20% chance somebody might like message back and like have make like a, a conversation, but usually it was pretty, uh, unre they were pretty unresponsive. Um, but yeah, mostly just cause I was, I had like never had a LinkedIn or like had to network before like last year or anything. Um, so even when I started networking, I was sort of viewing it as like a long-term thing and have, as a result, I, have, I think I feel, I feel like I have a lot of like good connections with people. I think that will help me like down the road and also just meeting new people is cool. Um, and then, yeah, the, and the other thing that I kind of quickly moved on from like Vanessa was um, dealing with the rejection. Like it definitely hit hard the first like few times, but the more it happens, sort of like ripping off a Band-Aid and the only thing you can really do is focus on the things that are like in your control. Um, like if somebody is looking for something and you're not it, then you have to find a new place who is looking for something, someone like you with your skills and stuff. And so just continuing to like hone those skills and reach out and apply. And, um, and also, yeah, the inability to change up your job search strategy, I think is a hindrance to some. Um, 
like kind of like Vanessa, I feel like I tried a little bit of everything between like mass applying and networking and getting like cobbling together any experience I could find and stuff. And um, and sometimes it's just a, a cold apply to a, a local company on Indeed that <laughs> in the end is what works out for you, at least in my case. Nice. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so just being mindful of time, I'm going to combine these two questions. Um, so you can feel free to answer or like a mix and match of both. But um, do you have any fun ways that you have you like to slide into people's DMs? I don't mean like personally, but on LinkedIn, OK, LinkedIn DMs <laughs> or any fun ways that uh, any fun questions you like to ask when you network with people or do coffee chats or whatnot? So a fun way that I would slide into DMs is like, if I notice they rock climbed and I'd be like, oh, hey, I, I rock climbed too, or whatever. Like one guy, he had a picture of Escanar from Seven Deadly Sins, which is an anime. I was like, oh, you watch anime? That's pretty cool. Can I talk to you about your job? <laughs> or things like that. But another coffee chat tactic is, as you can tell, my room is kind of messy. I have whiteboard, uh, snowboards over there. I used to have a camera and drones back there. I have like a professional mic here and that often leads the person on the opposite side to ask me questions about it they'll be like oh you snowboard too it's like we should probably go out sometime right and it, it really does connect it from being professional to more personal level and i found a lot of success having my room messy so i can also tell my mom that hey i left it for your job interviews instead of telling her to clean it up <laughs> but that's it for me As for me, um, maybe like I'm not so fun or anything, <laughs> but I like to hear people's stories, like their background, like where they came from. And I tend to network with people who came from like the same alma mater, like the same college I went to and specifically hone down the people who had non-traditional backgrounds and switch into software engineering. So for a while I was networking with them and asking about their story and what kind of advice they had or like how did they get their first job. So I find those stories really fun and those stories gave me ideas on how I could approach my you know journey. And what I learned from it is most of them got their first job just through cold applying so and actually that's how I got my job too is cold applying so but I, but at that time I just thought like I will never know what kind of story I will have so I will try everything yeah I think I do like a hybrid search um or a hybrid tactic between the two like I usually um if I am going to message somebody or if I someone messages me to talk, I usually will like creep their LinkedIn profile at least once, just try to glean any like personal, if there is any personal information, which if someone is like moderately, even a little active, like there might be like a comment that they say like, oh yeah, I like reading this genre or coffee or whatever. Um, and people with like, it's easy to uh, connect with someone if someone has like a personal like tagline like coffee aficionado so like i would ask them like yeah don't go too far back <laughs> um it's not like twitter or something but um but uh yeah like ask them a personal question usually like in an intro or um find some like mutual connection a lot of the jobs and things that I was reaching out for were in the like environmental or climate tech realm. So I had, I had some, usually some relevant connection to somebody, whether it was like maple sugaring and I saw that they were from Vermont or I used to like groom ski trails and they had like a picture of like skis on their like banner or something. I think that happened one time, but um, uh, trying, yeah, trying to make it personal and then, being like genuinely interested because like Vanessa it was like really cool just like hearing the majority of people I talked to were from like non-traditional backgrounds as well and just really cool just how many walks of life people come from. Nice.
super awesome. So I guess moral of the story is uh, listen to people's stories, don't clean your room, create people's LinkedIn's, right? <laughs> Okay, um, I think we have uh, time for, okay, I think we will probably have time to maybe do the last couple of questions really quickly. Um, so I guess looking back now, you, all three of you are employed, happily employed, hopefully for a good period of time. Um, what is one thing that you wish you knew? I guess like your, you know, your parting words, I guess, to us um, uh, when you started your job search. Um, and a bonus to this, if you have anything to add is, um, do you have any hot takes? What are some misconceptions you've had about the job search process that you might want to debunk? I think the best thing I wish I knew before starting my job search, even when I was learning, is to find mentors and multiple mentors at that as well. Because I wouldn't have known the things I've known if I got a mentor a lot earlier in my job search. Like they helped me technically, they helped me do interviews, they helped me with my resume, and they helped me speak technically to like my mentor was a software engineering manager so i had to explain technical concepts to him in a layman's term so that really did help me a lot and regarding hot takes i don't think i have hot take you can come back to me on that if we have time um for me i wish i knew how extremely hard the job search is <laughs> I mean, like I knew it was hard, but I didn't know it was extremely hard because of the competition. And I think maybe it's just unique to this past year where there are like layoffs everywhere. But um, knowing how hard the job search is, like if I knew about it in the beginning, I probably would have um, probably got a mentor early on but I didn't I eventually got mentor like through ADP list which they offer free mentoring um but yeah I think I want to second Sammy like having a mentor early and then knowing how freaking hard job searching is for your first tech job yeah I think um being able to ask for help early is very good and could possibly like cut some like a month or two out. Um, I, I started at the other thing that was told me early on was to start applying like before you think you're ready, um, which for me was even applying to jobs like five months after my boot camp ended, I still was like, these are very technical positions. And I, <laughs> um, so, I mean, your moral, I guess, is just you're, you're never really going to feel ready. So might as well start trying. Um, yeah, men mentors are huge. I had, I was fortunate to have a friend who was a mentor. Um, he had gone the traditional route of the CS degree back in like 2014. So he was a good like technical mentor. Um, but I had to look elsewhere for like moral support with like the job search. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. And I think we're getting some uh, links in the chat as well. Um, so thank you to everyone who's um, uh, putting, oh yeah, and Vanessa also linked her mentor as well. Um, okay, that was awesome. Thank you, everyone. Oh, okay, Sammy, sure. What's your hot take? Go for it. My hot take is uh, don't use Reddit, don't use LinkedIn. Avoid every news of gloom and doom and the media because it really is up to you and the personal connections you make rather than, oh, the economy is shit. We're not going to get a job. Like there's people I see on my LinkedIn, at least five or six every single day getting jobs, whether it's interns or juniors or senior developers, they're still getting jobs, even though the economy is bad. Right. But that's my hot take. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I think we have some time right now for our Q and A. Um, if people have any questions, feel free to use the raise hand feature or type it in the chat. Um, you can ask questions specifically to one of the panelists or you can throw out a general question. Don't be shy. This is a little side note, but I want to thank Vanessa because I had her on LinkedIn previously and I saw her 
wear a t-shirt with her QR code to a conference. And that gave me an idea. So I wasn't going to wear a t-shirt. So I actually made little business cards with my QR code. It's it's really bad to see, but. Yeah, yeah at the conference, I only had one person use it. So that was successful, even though it's just one person. Yeah. I've had a pretty good amount of success using the business card. A lot of people ended up adding me and they, it's a conversation starter, right? That's what I use it for. I got these printed at Vistaprint. I can't find where to raise my hand. So I think you go to reactions and then there's on the very bottom, it says reactions uh, and you can raise hand, but yeah, sure. Go for it. Helena, you can unmute your mic. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I was going to say, as um, I guess, like adding to the networking, I found that the easiest way for me to start networking was to just look up companies that I like already and find people that work there that do the job that I wish I could do. And then just hit them up and be like, hey, I like your job. Like, I really like your job. What do you do? Like, can you tell me more about it? Like, it isn't like, and some people don't respond, you know, that's just normal. Some people are busy and some people have responded and I got to learn more about like what their teams are like and kind of what their like challenges are at their work. Because like one person I saw, he worked at a gaming company and then he started working at Porsche. And that transition is so weird for like most people. So I just asked him like, how, how, how does your like day to day changed? So aggressively and you know like you can't get that kind of insight unless you do that job so it's really just valuable information that some people might be willing to share if you guys have like you know something similar in common or you just treat it like maybe you guys might be friends after so yeah, yeah that's so just kind of how i found it you just so i think to answer your question i think there was a question there but yeah, no, I definitely treated everyone as friends and rather than a personal connection. And that definitely did help me a lot. Yeah, being um, being intentional with your job search is definitely like one of those things that you can control. And it is a bigger bummer sometimes when you don't get to a, get a job at a place you like really, really want to work. But yeah, you can make connections at those places that might help down the road or just meet a nice person. Yeah, just things in common. Okay, uh, thank you. Let's go to Eric. There's a couple other audience questions in the chat, but Eric, let's go to Eric's question first. Hello, I'm sorry if I'm jumping over anybody by raising my hand here. Um, since you all have been on the job for a while now, I'm curious to hear your perspective on uh, if there's any skills you've picked up on the job that you feel like you should have had before getting that job that would have made you more competitive in the job search compared to other candidates? I would say everything. I knew, I thought I knew a lot coming in doing like your pet projects, but doing working with enterprise software, it's on a whole different beast. I did do open source projects and I would say that's more helpful because you understand code bases, you understand other people is running into your branch, you understand Git, that really did help a lot more than learning React or watching that YouTube tutorial on how to make a shopping cart. I agree with that. Um, having my experience at the internship or volunteer work, like learning how to set up your dev environment and learning how to share branches um, and be an expert at Git is something that I feel people should have more uh, to get into jobs and be comfortable talking about it, doing job interviews, like, you know, show off that you know how to Git very well. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think that was somewhat related to the other question by Josh. What are some tips to build collaboration skills to ensure you can be a strong software team member? Any any other tips other than Git? Practice rubber ducking. What rubber ducking is trying to explain a technical concept to in layman's terms because you're working with PMs, you're working with CS, 
you're working with account executives, you have to be able to understand how to say, oh, the database isn't loading because this bug, you have to be able to tell them that so they can communicate that to their customers. And I think that's one of the most important skills. Cool, cool. Any other questions for these wonderful people? Have there been any obvious transferable skills from your past careers that helped your transition? I want to say as a lab scientist before, um, we we're very good at documenting stuff, errors and things that worked. So it was a very easy transfer for me when I documented like components that I'm making for the team on Confluence. So I think that was like a direct transfer is knowing how to document and being comfortable just documenting everything. Anyone else? I just think for me, it was more of like the discipline, the motivation, keeping at it, treating everything like a job. So things that you would just normally pick up and communication as well, where I picked up from having a job where communication was super important, that was very transferable. But otherwise, I don't think I'm wiring anything on the job. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, for me, just having worked with a lot of different people in a lot of different industries, it just helped me. I've walked into a lot of different groups of different people at work and just gotten along with them and able to communicate effectively and collaborate and not always harmoniously, but most of the time, like cooperate pretty well together. And that, that was a big help, I think. Mm -hmm. For sure. I think there's one more question in the chat. Andre asked, building off of the transferable skills question, when you're interviewing, do you mention how these skills you've learned helped you become a better developer? Like how important is it to talk about these things? Go ahead, Louis. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think as a career transitioner trying to get your first job um, talking about as many relevant skills as you can from previous job or jobs is one of the, like the greatest strengths that you can have if it's not like a technical interview setting granted a lot of that's communication and stuff too as Vanessa explained very well um, be yeah, anything that you find relevant to just make you seem like a like well-adjusted eager to learn like team member anything you can talk about is helpful nice awesome okay so um i am mindful of time it is 9 p.m eastern standard time so we are going to pause the questions um at this point but thank you everyone so much for coming out thank you especially to our panelists tonight vanessa louie and sammy for your invaluable wisdom and insight um, we're going to plug in the LinkedIn connection sheet again, um, if uh, the uh, everyone, including the panelists too, if you can plug in your LinkedIn's there so people can connect with you, highly advise you to send a connection request, you have a reason, uh, sorry, send the connection request with a personal message. Um, you have more, you have another reason to, you know, you can say that you met at this event tonight um when you send those invites um we've also plugged in the slack invite link to our organization um if you want to learn more about events like this um you can also connect with me i post like event links like this for our, our, our tech tank all the time um and yeah that is pretty much all that we have for you tonight i am going to stop the recording